Hi. So I'll be talking to you about beaches today. And you might say, oh, why would you want to work on beaches? Well, beaches are fun places to be, and they're fun places to work. Here you see a bunch of scientists collecting some bottom samples in the surf zone. <laughs> No, really. There, there's a lot of fun things people can do at the beach, so therefore they flock to the beach, they come to the beach. There's a lot of visitors at the beach, partially because there's a lot of activities to do there, and partially because beaches are really beautiful. And in fact, it turns out that more people visit beaches in any one given year than all of our national parks combined. So then therefore, beaches are really a national resource. Um, so that may explain why people come to the beach to visit. It also partially explains why people like to live near beaches. It's also because beaches are a, um, a place where economic activity takes place. So a lot of um, infrastructure is near beaches, a lot of property is near beaches, and so that means beaches are also vulnerable. Things that happen on beaches are also vulnerable to um, damage by coastal storms, and so here's what happens when a hurricane hits a hotel complex, for example. Um, here's what happens when a hurricane breaches a barrier island. Here's a picture that Paul Komar took off the Oregon coast of what happens when bluffs erode and leave houses without foundations. And of course, there's also tsunami hazards. Now, how many of you here have ever been to a beach? Come on. <laughs> okay, how many of you have been to a beach in the wintertime? Okay, how many of you have actually observed a coastal storm? Oh, good, good. So many of you actually know what I'm talking about. When there's a storm on the coast, this is really not necessarily a safe place to be. But what that also means is that it's a very difficult place to make observations. Because any kind of um, instrument that you place in this area will likely be destroyed, likely be lost. It's a very difficult place to um, observe during stormy times. But it, in, during stormy times is also when this rapid change is taking place. Things are eroding, the sediment erodes very quickly. So if you want to understand the system, you need to observe it during storms, and you need to observe it frequently during storms. Just a before and after picture just does not do the trick here. Now, another complication is, well, beaches do recover during the summertime. We do know that there is more dry beach area during the summertime, so somehow the sediment moves back onto the beach during calmer wave times. Um, here's, for example, a picture from La Jolla. This is the wintertime when you can see the pebble. Here's the summertime when the sand has actually moved back onto shore. Now, this happens over a really long period of time. So here now you have the challenge that you need to be there through most of the summer to really be able to observe the sequence of events that leads, lead to this. So I would say that maybe it is in the past 40 years or so, this is according to my view, that nearshore research has really taken off, and some of these things have been explained. Um, that also corresponds to, so things started really taking off right around the time that I was born. That, of course, is a complete coincidence. Um, <laughs> around 40 years ago, though, is also when nearshore research at COAS really started taking off, and as you can guess, that, that progress was made within that time period is really not very, a coincidence at all. Um, if you want to make observations and if you want to make discoveries in an area like this where uh, observing things is very challenging, what you really need is a bunch of really clever, creative people who can come up with ways to observe the system. And then once you've observed the system, well, your observations are still going to be relatively sparse. You need a bunch of very smart people who can put together the hypotheses and then actually show how the puzzle pieces fit together. And it just so happens that those people were at OSU. And in fact, when I was a grad student, it was one of those places that I looked up to. Wow, how can those people get all of this stuff done? How do they do it? So having come here eight years ago, I'm actually very proud and happy that, that this is where I ended up, the place where really a lot of these neutral problems got solved. Or, and what I'd like to do is walk you through a few of these. But um, Laura told me that I really need to cut my talk short. So I will speed through a few of them, and I will probably not get to this very last one. And honestly, the very last one is probably not as big deal of a discovery as the other ones, but it is the one that I had a hand in. So I was really kind of interested in talking to you about that. But I will review these other ones that are really the more important ones. In fact, I want to talk to you first about sort of how the plan form of beaches, what they look like and why they look the way they look. And in fact, what things like El Ninos have to do with beaches in Oregon. And I think until maybe the late 1970s, it was really generally thought of that, oh, let me just tell you, though, 
This is sort of my retelling of some of these stories, and it's really snapshots in these stories. And the folks here in the audience are really the ones who put these stories together, who put the puzzle pieces together. So I'm telling you these stories from my perspective. And if by any chance they don't make sense to you, it really is my representation thereof. And you can go back to the audience, to really the people who are here, who can tell you the real story then. But this story is about whether or not El Nino's affect the plan form of beaches as far north as Oregon. And it turns out that they do. And I think it was until the 82-83 El Nino that, that people thought that that was perhaps not the case. But in the 82-83 El Nino year, some very disturbing um, and very pronounced beach erosion was observed. One of the examples was at Neetard's Bay, at Neetard's Spit. And here's a picture of what Neetard's Spit looks like from the north. So looking at it from Oceanside, if you haven't been there, it's a totally gorgeous place to be. But Cape Lookout State Park here is on the south end of that spit, and there was some very pronounced erosion taking place there. And in this case, it was Paul Comar and his colleagues who put the puzzle pieces together and figured out that what happens during an El Nino year is that storms tend to approach, winter storms tend to approach from further south than they usually do. So they cause longshore currents going north that are stronger than they usually are which means that generally the southern end of a littoral cell will experience erosion and the northern end of it will experience um, accretion. They show very convincingly that this was indeed the case. Of course, this led them to think more about what kind of long-term changes we are to expect if we think about climate change and things of that sort. One of the other things that they worked on subsequently was looking at what the waves were, have really been doing over the last 25 years or so and they're finding that especially the storm waves up north are definitely increasing. So storms are increasing in intensity. The periods are getting longer also. So then you have to think about what these littoral cells are going to do in response to things like that. And in order to observe them, you can, again, come up with very clever ways. And again, you need to observe the bathymetry very frequently. You need to know what the beach looks like underwater. And one of the systems that was developed originally here at OSU is a jet ski system that is now very um, extensively being used to rapidly measure these things. Okay, what else? So a second topic, along shore currents in the surf zone. Remember I just told you that the way the, the plan form of the beach changes is because of these longshore currents that are really due to waves breaking on the beach because the waves dump all of their momentum into these longshore currents. And I think in the 1970s, people thought that they kind of understood longshore currents pretty well. And then in the 1980s, researchers started a very long, maybe a 20-year set of experiments. Well, no, they didn't observe the beach for 20 years. But on and off, um, they conducted experiments that spanned 20 years at a site called Duck in North Carolina on the East Coast. They were very well-conceived experiments, very well-planned experiments. And one of the people that really spearheaded these experiments was, was our very own Rob Holman here from OSU. And during those experiments, it became clear that the longshore current really wasn't as well behaved as the theories would have um, predicted that they were. And that instead, the longshore current develops. So here's a picture of what a model might say. Within just a few hours of a storm's arrival, the longshore current develops into this turbulent jet um, where lots of vortices are spewed offshore. And this is a lot of implications for things like um, pollutant transport, sediment transport, and um, um, nutrient transport. And so this was definitely one of the discoveries that are originated with people here at OSU. What else? One of the more important things, I think, is the Argus program. And many of you have worked with Argus data or have at least known about it. And so I probably can go through this relatively quickly. But this was one of those occurrences where, well, you know, we need to observe the beach for a long period of time, through the whole year perhaps. But that's kind of a very expensive proposition. Unless you're Rob Holman and you're clever and you pick up an off-the-shelf video camera and shoot the beach for quite a while. In fact, you do 10-minute time exposure images of what the beach looks like. When you do that, it turns out that these individual breakers, now if you start time exposing this, it turns out that you end up getting an understanding of where the waves are preferentially breaking because that shows up in the image as a, as a bright band. Okay, so now if you do this for 10 minutes, and time is going to speed up, thankfully, here, you actually get an understanding not just where the waves are breaking, and those are the shallow bars out there, but also how those bars are varying in the alongshore direction. If you want to get a quantitative view of what that is, so that's a qualitative picture, if you want to get a quantitative picture, then you really have to georeference everything. And once you do that, 
you end up with a picture that really tells you what the bars look like, what your longshore scales are, how far away they are from shore in quantitative terms. Once you put numbers onto a picture like this, it becomes an amazingly powerful tool. And with this tool, um, Rob and the Coastal Imaging Lab have been able to look at entire years of what a beach does. And here you're looking at a movie of what a beach in Australia does. This is Palm Beach, Australia. It's actually a very famous beach near Sydney and in fact just flying back yesterday on the airplane, the United Air Magazine talks about Palm Beach, what a cool place.